Lovely, absolutely beautiful. What is too hot down there? Uh, too too hot. Well, for Brisbane, it is it uh, gets over the forties, but it's also incredibly humid. Mm -hmm. um, forties and, and humid. Um, that's killing. Yeah, it. yeah. We 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 get to you know some somewhere around the forty five mark at the sort mm -hmm. of in at the most. But anything over about thirty five is a hot day. Yeah. I'm from the Azores and, and 30 and humid is, is pretty bad. So yeah. I can imagine. We're all going to have to get used to uh, things mm -hmm. that are dramatically warmer than that. I think, I don't know if trends are any indicator. Um, yeah. It's all very strange. Have you, have you all read ministry for the future? No, I've, I've not finished it, but it opens with a uh, wet bulb die off in india that kills off lots and lots and lots of people and if you look up wet bulb temperatures uh it's basically the the ambient temperature and humidity mix at which your body can no longer get rid of heat uh, and, and so and so the temperature can be sometimes surprisingly low uh it's, i think it's a gradient i'm not exact i can't actually explain it the way like a good science popularizer could uh, but but you can die of heat exposure if you can't exhaust the, the the heat from your body. And that's what happens in a wet bulb disaster. So the, the movie starts with that and then it turns into sort of eco-terrorists. Uh, some people decide that the only way to provoke action in the world's governments is to start like doing terroristy kind of things. And it, and it goes from there. Yet another diversion. We had another diversion. I know. I know. <laughs> Good Lord. We started by saying that uh, that we there's so much going on in the world and so much taking away our attention. So yeah. And on the OGM calls, pretty frequently, uh, Douglas Carmichael will scold us for not being single-minded about climate change, and not and not and not all doing more about climate change individually and collectively. Um, and I feel like many of us are doing what we know to do and what we can do in our field because we think it contributes to solving the climate change problem. But that's complicated. I mean, for, for me, I, I like I work on trust because I think if we don't resolve trust, we can never have the conversations we need to have to arrive at a modicum of consensus on moving forward on these issues. And I think that that having some grand unified agreement is impossible. I think, I think, you know, having everybody go, oh yes, these are the facts that this is what's happening is just fantasy land. Um, so what can we do pragmatically that appeals to enough constituencies that it's actually implementable? That's a place I'd like to go. And strangely, I'm just thinking, I don't, I, I don't have a neo book planned that addresses that. Meaning, in my in mm -hmm. my own in my own fantasy in in my own imagination, uh, I am currently writing a neo book about design from trust. I have another one planned that is called "What If We Trusted You," that uses a, a chunk of what's in uh, design from trust, but then goes off in a more philosophical uh, way. But I don't have something that could work uh, aimed at the climate crisis, and I I don't know that I'm the writer for the climate crisis, but I don't know. I'm realizing and just talking this through that I probably need to have more about the climate crisis in the books that I'm planning on writing. Yeah, is, is that something that you, do you think that you'll explore it a little bit now on thinking about that, Jerry? Yeah, that, that that's what I meant by by what I just mm -hmm. said is that I think that it's a, a bit of an imperative for me to to mm -hmm. think more about it and then to put more more content or more ideas about that in the books. I mean, I, in, in in design from trust, I have a, a section that I, I just this morning in the shower, I was thinking, oh God, that section's going to grow, uh, and it's it's it, right now it's titled a reality check, uh, which is come on, Jerry, what planet? Did, some of you are probably thinking, what planet did you fall out of? Uh, because you know trust is so broken, and people are so actively trying to undermine trust. How can you possibly say trust is the way forward? Which is what my argument is that we have to recover trust in in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, th I think I'm going to have a lot to write about in that section. 
I'll ask. Well, yeah, I think with environmental, with climate change, I mean, uh, especially because that's part of that long, you know, it goes back a couple of centuries, some, that impact, and you looking at the erosion of trust, um, you know, it's, it's probably, I mean, probably just takes you into this really big area of the movement of people off farms and out of, um, if you wanted to go that way, and uh, into, um, you know, factory and industrial living, um, it's probably, it's got probably a massive amount to do with trust and then the trust of our, our uh, institutions to manage what's been known for a long time as an issue uh, and whether they're able to. You know, it's, it's a probably a fertile area there. And, um, but I, I, what I'm hearing too is it's one that you don't think you can avoid and it's probably uh, it's making me think about what I'm writing, whether I've got anything in there as well. <laughs> I don't. Huh. Mm. <laughs> um, and, I, and I'm with you. And, and you're making me realize that there's so many big issues. I mean, I, I'm an amateur student of history and I love, unfortunately, I love the dark history of capitalism and consumerism because how we got here is is um, important uh, and matters a lot to how we interpret what's going on now and where we think we might go. Uh, but it, it this thing can blossom incredibly into you know more and more sub areas and i'm wondering how that all fits hey Stuart, good to see you Stuart, you're back i'm yeah. back i'm back i'm back how were your travels um they were good aside from getting sick and having to <coughs> cut my trip in half <laughs> oh that's not good sorry about that no it was nasty it was very very nasty and um it was a trip of what I would say, um, testing limits, and I've discovered I've discovered my limits at this point in time <laughs> by pushing over the edge. All oh right? man! Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think that might be the last flight to Asia. Uh, aside from getting sick, just jet lag is just um, my body can't do it anymore. How long was your longest leg? 17 hours to uh, that's a long time to sit in the plane no it's just it, it it's it's just crazy yeah well, well you know, my, my my metric is <clears throat> if you watch two movies slept uh had a couple meals and you're still not quite three quarters of the way there that's a really long flight <laughs> just done been there done that mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I was just saying at the top of the call for Jax, who's in uh, Australia, uh, that April and I will be in Australia in November, December this year. So um, that'll be a short flight. Lovely. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So you awesome. just made me look forward to that flight out. Yeah, great. I mean, the other thing is that um, the weather in Asia this time of year, it was, it was 95 degrees and 95 humidity. I didn't want to leave my hotel room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. well, we're, glad, we're glad you're back in the comfort of your home. Yep, me too. Me, me too. And and somehow, somehow Jennifer is able to just you know power on through these. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, mm -hmm. The the most uncomfortably hot I've ever been was in uh, what's the island off of Tanzania uh it's not mozambique it's uh oh totally forgot. zanzibar yes zanzibar thank you zanzibar in the z's i was thinking m's and i'm like nah it's not the m's uh -huh. uh, so, so we went to zanzibar after we talked together in in uh, dar es salaam <clears throat> and then april of course planned a, a beautiful little trip afterward a piece of which took us to zanzibar but i had gotten heat stroke basically crossing the great rift valley <clears throat> And was feeling pretty pretty down. So we stay in a in a in a pension in Zanzibar where there's like fans but no AC, and I cannot get rid of heat. I am I am just like suffering. It was bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we did we we had a couple of days in um, in Cambodia in Siem Reap, um, the the um, old temples, um, including the temple where Angela. Jolie filmed, um, um, oh, what's the name of that? Tomb, Tomb Raider? Tomb Raiders, Tomb Raiders, which was a, just extraordinary in the sense that they they let the temples go 
for a couple of hundred years. And these trees started to grow um, all out of the temples. I mean, it was, and to me, one of the most interesting things was very similar to this, to Southern Spain, where the, the Christians and the Muslims kept, you know, saying, fuck you, in terms of, you know, taking over the, the territory. The same thing with the Buddhists and the Hindus uh, in, um, in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of who the king was in favor of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm back. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, good. Last week, we um, made a start on our pops. Uh, it was lovely. Uh, I, I don't know that we did everything, and we haven't really popped anything yet. So we haven't uh, done and another word. It used to be called a thunderclap was a name in the early days of social media when you all powered things together. I heard somebody refer to something like this a little bit also as a snowball, which was, I thought, nice. There's the whole idea of, of getting momentum and building a bigger snowball. So uh, those are good. And we could go, I, I don't think anybody's added any documents to the requested documents for pop review, but we could go back and uh, look in on what we've got. Uh, or we could take a different path if anybody else has uh, druthers, but uh, open, open to suggestions from the floor. I'd like us to continue what we started last week. I think it, it it's a worthy experiment. And if it works, that's great. And we left having just opened up uh, what, what Jose was it your your document or which one I think so I yeah. think and but it would be good probably for everybody just to sort of review the the previous one just to give a, a high level on that cool um because I as you say I don't think we've done it so it'd be good to hmm uh, anybody with feedback on on the process so far who's been involved? I mean, <clears throat> thoughts about this POPs subproject? Ways to improve it? Other thoughts? You're um, muted, Rick. Rick, can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, you're not muted on Zoom, but we're not hearing your voice, Rick. Say something. Hello, can you hear now me? Now? Yes, you're good. Okay. No, I, I I just like to, an update from last week because uh, uh, maybe that would be helpful. Um, so last week we looked at the uh, POPs submission form, which I have opened someplace, and I will post a link to in the chat. There we go. Um, last week we were in this spreadsheet, which has four submissions. Uh, George Pores was actually quite short. It's a tweet. Uh, but Jose and Klaus and Jax had all submitted uh, documents. And the, the, the Google Docs links are right there in the spreadsheet. And we went and took a look at Jose's um, on collaborative knowledge and didn't have enough time to talk about it. So, what did we talk about for... We looked at Klaus's um, work, and um, and yeah, and we had we had a fairly solid conversation beforehand because I was new and mm -hmm. <laughs> we took a little bit of time just um, getting settled in. But um, and we talked. We mostly focused on Klaus's work and looking at um, his piece with the Chat GPT and Klaus um, interaction, and then looking at how how it was landing, whether um, what he needed in terms of some pointers for it to be clear in the context and um, and we really went into there and then I think we just got to the end and then it was um, time for um, Jose's work. Sounds great. And Klaus's uh, work was titled Worldviews, the War of Ideas. <clears throat> um, So, we don't know if he's published that, right? We don't know if he's published that, uh, exactly. So if you want to get to the collaborative knowledge piece that Jose wrote, uh, please go to the spreadsheet. That who I, I just put a link to the spreadsheet in the, in, the, in the Google Doc. I don't have permission to give you a link directly to the collaborative knowledge piece, although oh, Jose, you could change that? that in the document. 
it, it says ask permission for link. I think you've not changed the settings so that a link is possible. Huh. Anyone uh, with a link. Can it make us commenters maybe? Share. Oh, that's weird. General access. Okay, anyone with a link can view. It has just changed for me, so this we're good. Oh, wait, it says ask to share maybe for editing. Huh. Here, I'll make everyone an editor. Let's see if that helps. Cool. There we are. Thank you. No, thank you. And I'll put that <laughs> link in the chat also, just so anybody can go there straight. Um, thank you. Got it. So I don't know how you're showing up everywhere else. Uh, I'm assuming that the capybara is um, is you, Jax, huh. based on based on your location in the world. Yeah. What What does it say? <laughs> it, you know how it's the little animals that oh. show up on top. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? I don't even I don't even know what a capybara is. It looks a, like a marsupial. It's a very friendly marsupial, but uh, yeah. Already started learning. <laughs> um, I don't know why, because I'm logged in as me, and I should be showing up as me, not an anonymous animal, but there you yeah, go. Yeah, you're showing up as a mink. Okay. Uh, Funny is that? Yeah. Oh, interesting. So I've lost the capybara. I've, I, I've only got a mink and a penguin. Oh, hang on. And, and, no, the, mink just, oh. and the mink just you know, went away, so I think I'm the penguin. I might have too many sites open or something. Or I might be the capybara. <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, anyway at yeah. the, uh, if we want to take a minute to, to read the document, um, one thing this document doesn't address, which was a piece of our charter here, was uh, we're trying to do posts or pops about the election cycle, but that's okay. Um, and this nicely has mentions of the Neobooks project as well as the R Protocols project. And that's kind of the point of the, of the post is how these two projects might help us um, collaborate and get over the information flood. And Jose, where were you thinking of posting this? What's your usual practice? Uh, LinkedIn is more often than not. Um, okay. And so, and and maybe even our um, our blog. Cool. Okay. Um. And a thing that we can easily collaborate with one another on is hashtags. Um, that would be fun to just sort of, uh, you know, you can put some hashtags in and you can recommend some. I'm still getting used to posting more things on LinkedIn, but if you, um, with articles, it, I think, gives you a moment to do hashtags separately after you've posted the article. So embedding the hashtags in the, in the article itself winds up being duplicative, but in posts, I think you just write the hashtags into the text of the post. And I'm not sure that what I just said is right. I think it is. Essentially, what I think happens is when you write an article, it then offers you an opportunity to make a post of the article. And uh -huh. that's so you're essentially just writing a post that links back to the article. But the articles are kind of like LinkedIn is not the best UI design, but the articles are meant to be a construct more or less like a blog. So, so that LinkedIn is trying to be more like Substack so that anybody can create a consistent publication vehicle uh, that would be under some title. And then articles go under that title kind of. I'm not even sure that's, that's necessarily true. Um, uh, yeah, it, there's a place to... It, yeah, you're right. I think you're right. I could be wrong, but I've done both. I mean, articles give you an ability to add more links, more um, more images if you want, and they do start looking more like a sub stack. And there's a different place that you can edit them um, in LinkedIn as well, and then you, you can get a list of them. So it is a bit more formal, yeah. um, whereas the posts are a little bit more limited. But I've seen that, you know, do you want to make this into an article too? So I tend to use just posts as little, like little Facebook grabs almost. And, you know, they're, they're very lighthearted, but the articles are where I actually do longer pieces. So this this would be a good article um, that would make sense to use it in that format. 
And I, I don't see any text in both. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't see any loss to doing the article. At first, I thought the article had a different kind of uh, chat uh, function, but it it doesn't. It still has the usual comments. You know, every, anybody can comment in your article, et cetera, et cetera. That works fine. Uh, so, uh, so Jose, were you thinking of doing a post or an article? An article with a linking post. And, and okay. I think what I've seen is when I do that, um, the linking post, um, is where the comments are. So, which is really good because it actually gives, um, you some traction on the post, right. Uh, which gives you more exposure. Cool. Good. Um, and this is stuff we don't need to talk about every time we, we run a post. We just need to sort of sort out like how the tools work, right? Mm -hmm. And what we want to do with them. Um, sounds good. You could also submit this to Pete. Uh, mm -hmm. and, it's already been done. Yeah. Oh, oh cool. Okay. Now, when you do that, uh, so for this week? I, I sent it to him last week. Uh, but yeah, I was going to tell him that it should be ready to go this week. Sounds good. A cool thing to do uh, would be to send it to him and, and have him put at the top, as he did with the thing he uh, wrote for me uh, that I submitted, uh, this, you know, original post over here. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the, one of my wish lists for Pete's week, bi-weekly plex is that the individual pieces have permalinks, because that, that's what I do. I, I, I point to individual pieces. I don't, I, you know, I put all the plex issues in, but then there's six essays and a couple of photo essays in an ep in an issue, none of which are, are easily called out or pointed to. Um, so in this way, if it's been, if it's been posted somewhere else, then that's the canonical reference for it. <clears throat> and it can just then be included into the Plex issue, which is great. Um, well, all by, all by which to say, if you can post this officially on LinkedIn soon, because we get our work done here and it all works fine, then you can pass that link to Pete and say, could you add right. this to the post and, and so forth. Cool. Not hugely important, but I think I think a nice practice that that uh, uh, that will help us get done the things we're trying to get done. Um, any one thoughts on the piece on what you would add, subtract, uh, recommend to the collaborative knowledge piece that Jose wrote? Yeah, I, I have a couple, couple of suggestions. One Please. is, uh, is a, a, a call to action. And I'll give you an example of how to reduce the noise and increase the signal. Uh, somebody posted, I, I was looking through LinkedIn about the DNC, you know, looking for what disinformation was out there. Um, and I came across one person's post and I thought, this is beautiful. So what I did, I cut and paste the post and I said, can you refute any claims for disinformation? which it did, and it did it far quicker than I could ever have done. I mean, it really did a nice, and I haven't quite finished it because my, it had about seven points that refuted this person's claim to knowledge. And it, it was a claim counterpoint, and I was using uh, Perplexity AI to do that, the, the pro version. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, that's an example of how we have to take responsibility uh, for reducing the noise and increasing the signal. So I had fun doing it, actually, because it only took me about five minutes. I haven't cut and paste everything over. But the point that I'm making, uh, Jose, is it might be helpful. A call to actions, what are the simple steps you can do? And that's an example of a single, simple step, is mm -hmm. how can we actually all hold people accountable? But from my point of view, it should be automatic. Uh, anybody who puts something up uh, on LinkedIn like that should automatically have an AI checking for claims and counterclaims to information that you can access quickly to see whether the information is accurate or not. So I don't know whether that resonates with you, but that was something that came to mind because I just did it a couple of hours ago. Are you suggesting sort of a self-debunking? Uh, well, self-debunking, no, it's cross-bunking, really. Um, well, cross-bunking, uh, that's new. Yeah, well, okay. yeah, cross-debunking. Cross cross-debunking? <laughs> Hey, that's a word to use. Cross bunking hashtag. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, or or cross debunking. Let's put it that way. Okay, cross debunking. Yeah, um, but debunking stuff. Um, you know, a little, a few little tips that anyone can do quickly, so that you can, uh, you know, this person, as far as I'm concerned, um, deserves to have their reputation. In fact, I reported. The information on LinkedIn is disinformation. Uh, now, what they'll do with that, I don't know. 
But if we don't have some mechanism of, of, of self uh, monitoring things, and, and if something's clearly, you know, way over the edge, then it needs to be, um, you know, de-amplified or removed. So the, the, uh, the thought here is let's create stuff that in itself is creating less clutter rather than the idea of trying to fight the clutter that's there because the clutter that's there the more we fight the clutter i think we actually create more clutter because uh, it, everybody's going to have a different view on what the current clutter is and what's right or wrong with it and so my my the idea here was how do we build systems of thinking systems of doing that actually um, improve how we see this knowledge from the start so that we're not in this cat and mouse game of everybody gets to say whatever they say. If, if they say crap, then we just ignore it. And we only pay attention to the stuff that's created in a way that makes more sense. And that's the intention for, for, for what neobooks I think should be and for what um, our protocols is about, which is building protocols rather than just ideas, right? Um, rather than just, I have an opinion, let me write it out there, right? No, I have a protocol and we can work on the protocol and improve the protocol and then use protocols openly so that everyone can benefit from that protocol. Um, so that's, that's kind of the idea. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it makes total sense. The way I would separate that out is between uh, primary and secondary prevention. So the primary prevention is to ensure that this, the signal noise ratio is high and that comes to the integrity of the writer and crux. So for example, if somebody submitted, you know, I submitted my things to this for, you know, support the claim, whatever. So that's primary, but you're not going to stop the noise. I mean, there's still going to be people out there. So um, while it'd be in the ideal world, everyone would do primary prevention and correct their misconceptions before they let them out on the world. But I think that's highly impractical. I think it takes both approaches. So, I mean, if you're primary focused on the former, that's fine. But, you know, there is so much noise out there that you, you have no control over. But if there's some way of aut automatically eliminating things that are completely and utter rubbish, then, um, you know, factually incorrect, you know, the world is flat, whatever it is, you know, uh, then it's, it's, uh, it's removed from the, uh, the platform. Um, a question, Rick, um, given the specific content of Jose's post on collaborative knowledge, what made you suggest the pre-bunking uh, feature should should he do that to himself and always do that? Do you then publish it? Is that is that a way of hardening your own post? I don't, I don't know why you recommended that to his post. Oh, it was a reaction to it, um, and it was it, it arose from something I just did two hours ago, um, and so it was fresh in my mind. But um, what I didn't do in this was actually to submit the post and say, "Can you please?" Um, uh, refute any claims in this article that need either strengthening or inaccurate. So, I mean, submitting your work to that sort of um, independent, you know, it's there are limitations with AI because it does have some, you know, delusions and hallucinations, whatever. But actually, I, I think they're exaggerated, at least my experience in using perplexity AI. I find perplexity AI to be pretty good. I haven't come across any significant as yet delusions or hallucinations when I've done things. So, but that's that's on the pro version where they provide citations. Uh -huh. I agree with it, but that's a separate issue. Uh, and then two other small things. Um, what you did made me think, and I, I don't know that perplexity does this or that other engines do this, and I think I might just not have enough experience with them, but wouldn't it be cool to have the query you just did preloaded that, so that you can submit any URL to it and it does a, a pre-cross bunking of that piece because mm -hmm. it's been because it's been set up to sort of do exactly that. You, yeah. you don't you don't have to regenerate the prompt. You don't have to do anything like that. Uh, it just has a it's a pre-bunker agent 
you know, in, in perplexity, for example. And then the other thought is um, what Jose was just describing about, I call it sort of crystallizing what we know. It, it, the O'Neill books is very much an effort to try to reduce the, the, the torrent and the garbage out there by having us re reuse uh, nuggets and uh, and say where they came from and what they're based on and all those kinds of things. So so very very much a a case of oh this this collection this sub corpus of what Rick or Jose or Jax wrote um, I agree with entirely and I'm just going to include it by reference in in you know what I believe and maybe even in some of my content. And, and to add to that, if it's done automatically, um, as suggested, that there would be a reputation score or some sort of rank, ranking of the, uh, so that as new information comes out, you know, things may be partially debunked. Um, so, I mean, that's the, that's the advance of science. I mean, you know, you, you leave your high pressure, you establish a, a way of viewing the world, and then somebody else comes along and challenges and something else comes new. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's an obviously an iterative process. Anybody else with thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I might uh, jump in a little bit. I've got many thoughts, actually, and I'll try and Excellent. keep them concise. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, uh, and I'm, I'm, excuse me if I do do some long connection of dots, but there, there is, um, to, to start off with, I'm, I think the value, of, um, I, I know, especially in your, in your context in the States, um, there the truthfulness is a really big part of whether the the validity of the article. See, so you're talking about um, the debunking process. It also assumes that there's going to be a lot of mistruth out there, and I understand that completely. Um, given one of your um, political contenders at the moment and the history that we know of that, um, there are other ways also that this. Um, it may not just be that it's factually incorrect. It might be that there are um, other things going on as well in terms of um, being obscure, or very difficult to read, or, um, at, or um, an idea that's still being germinated. For example, there might be other ways that something might be becoming um, cluttering up people's ability to access. Uh, I'll, I'll get to them. I think there's a main point there. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But while we're talking about this sort of um, clutter, there's a phrase that I've heard coined called digital plastic. And it's, it comes back to that idea almost of our um, environmental discussion at the beginning. And that is that in the world that creates, especially with the emergence of generative AI, in a world that creates, can, can endlessly, infinitely create more and more and more text without even having a person have, intending to, um, you can say, I, I'd like to, you know, I'd like you to copy and paste this 1,000 times and put it up on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Um, this is creating something called digital plastic, and that has a very large uh, data um, cost and an environmental cost, as well as our ability to find what it is we need to find. So we're essentially creating a plastic um, rubbish dump in the way that we had a crisis around plastic before we knew how to recycle it. So I know that's a long tangent, but there might be a hashtag if you wanted to use it called uh, digital plastic. Then there's that comes, it's been coined, it's only a new term, uh, by an academic called uh, Leon Furs. Furzy, I'll put his name in here if you do want to check the his use of it. Um, Leon Furs. And uh, he uses it, he's, he is an academic who works on uh, generative AI and the academic, uh, you know, yeah, educational um, ways of thinking about AI and he's got this very big concern about digital clutter and how you find the right information especially for people who are in a learning environment so that's the first one um it I the thought debunking makes me also think about as we go through the ability even to influence those um AIs as we go along because I'm sure that there's um there's a great market for Copilot or Bard or whoever to start putting in a debunking tool uh, into their, especially those website browsers. So I don't know if you had a go at them, but using Microsoft uh, Copilot, for example, you've got your web, your regular web page, and beside it, you can have a running summary of that text. I think that people are probably going to be using that summary 
They go, here's my website, here's my LinkedIn page, here's the article that's popped up. Oh, um, nice picture, great. I love um, Isaiah's work. And now I'm just going to look and read through the AI summary on the side of it rather than read the, the page. So there's a mechanism that's starting to happen there. Uh, so it might be that um, there's opportunities for someone here ourselves to influence that as it goes along for that debunking. Uh, but getting to the content of the article, um, I feel, think, um, I say, the, the, is the main intent here to explore the, um, the, the clutter and then provide a couple of suggestions around it, or is it to highlight the suggested areas that you um, are introducing, which is the... Um, the NeoBooks project and the um, R Protocols project. Um, is, is, it, which, where's the emphasis there? Uh, it was a realization on my part that there was something that bound these two projects that I'm working on. Yeah. And the, that the binding of these two things is something that I hadn't even really intellectualized. Like it was just mm -hmm. sort of like in the background and, okay. and came to the realization that, oh, wait a minute. Really, what we're trying to deal with with these two things is this one, in part, right? Not not in total, but in part, this one thing that's happening, uh, which is this um, just overabundance of of information. None of which any of us can really figure out the viability of it, right? Unless we spend forever. It's sort of like saying, "Yes, I agree to the terms of this software agreement," right? Because none of us are going to write read the five thousand pages of crap, right? Um, so it's it you know our, our world has turned into that, and so yeah. trying to sort of capture that and then connect it to these two projects that are being worked on. Okay, well, that's um, that's good because that's that's how I uh, interpreted what um, it was as well, and I really enjoyed. I found it, uh, especially as a new person to the Neo Books project, I really found it um, enjoyable in terms of, oh, okay, oh, that's, this is, um, I mean, I've read, read a little bit now, but it really elevated for me what the project is about. And for that, then I felt that actually the, the thrust of the article is actually saying, hey, um, it's not so much, like I think we all understand pretty quickly around that noise um, and to go it takes, I think it's because there's, it's quite a few paragraphs in that we end up going and here's the solution. And I guess for, for the um, strength of the article, it would be really great if it was, at, if I, I was able to see kind of early that this is actually, you know, hold on, read this folks. Cause I've got, a, I've got a couple of, I found a couple of solutions. Um, so there's actually like a, a hook earlier on. Mm -hmm say, oh, keep reading, because this is not just about digital clutter. This is actually about a couple of methods which are, which actually help us find the gem in the rough um, or in the rubbish, where we're, so to speak, here. So I, I found maybe if that, if I don't, I don't think it needs to be a lot of rewritten, rewriting, but if there's a, an ability to elevate those that we're actually talking about a couple of really interesting projects here, which are being, um, which actually have that solution. For me, that was that's something I was going to be looking for and would keep me reading because it is an answer to that digital plastic. Um, I thought a couple of two other things here you might want to consider about uh, mentioning because it, um, you know, things like economical writing or people's ability when they're writing to, you know, some of that is um, author onus. So, um, you know, you said that thing, we can actually, or someone said that we can contribute to having better quality information and better quality, and that's author onus. And in the era of AI, with this generation of clutter and digital plastic, we've got an ability to become authors or the Neo Books project or the um, uh, Protocols project to become places of trust because there's actually that interaction going on and it's um, live. Um, I thought it was probably like the way you described it, with it, they were like living projects which people are actually actively engaged in and, and talking about and debate. Yes, and that's that's different to static text reading and I think that's something to really come out. That's, that's quite exciting and um, it provides a live marketplace kind of interaction, not, not 
financial marketplace mm -hmm. where people are actually, or that soapbox kind of area where you've got someone who's saying, this is what I believe, and you've got other people interacting around um, saying, no, that's not true, or here's the here's yesterday's newspaper that has it differently. So you've got an ability there for um, life in text. Now, I don't want to go too academic, um, and I'm not going to because I'm not good. <laughs> it's not my field. But if you've got this idea that there's all of this, it's impossible to get the truth or it's impossible to get the quality information and because it's like a rubbish tip of, inf of information out there. And then there's this place where you've got quality discussion that people, any any Joe Blow can access and have a, and interact with, which I think was what Twitter was supposed to be like in the old days. Um, then you've got a place where, where you've got, Quality, um, some quality coming through and that uh, that does amplify so anyway I think I've got that sense from here and it would be really great to see that um, rather than to go too much into the clutter we're pretty confident I think most people go yeah I know the problem and go go right up um, the last uh, little point for me is around um, I wrote sense seeking and uh, it's the reason that people are interacting with digital information I think they fall into kind of two camps. One is that kind of um, numbing and scrolling, but the other one is looking to have some sense seeking. They're sense seeking. They're seeking sense, and um, that might be a hashtag in a way too. That some or something around that, which is the purpose and the um, the benefit of someone actually reading this is they're actually having an opportunity to make some sense of it, some meaning. So. Yeah, there's my there's my Those two bits. Awesome. I really so enjoyed much. it. Helped me help me get into what we're talking about and make it gave food for thought. Thank you. And and thank you for those ideas. Those are great. Great. If you don't mind, I, I'd like to um pass them by you um after making some changes. So if... sure. Um and Jose, what Jack's just suggested, I just um just very informally and casually just uh, made a comment at it to the title of the piece, because collaborative knowledge, I was like, hmm, I don't, I'm not sure I would stop and read that. But if you talk about live or living collaborative knowledge, mm -hmm. or getting to living collaborative knowledge or something like that, I'm like, oh, my, my head is going to turn more, um, which is a big piece of what I think you're trying to say and we're trying to do together. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to help each other with this, right? This isn't easy all around. So thank you. Well, I was struck, cousin, by your by your email, by OGM email this morning about the um, <clears throat> I can't remember what you said in it, but the the thing that Kevin Do uh, Doyle Jones is re reacting to too, um, <clears throat> because I think you were saying something that I've been trying to tease out too a little bit uh, around not thinking. Not, I don't want to not not thinking logically, which is the way I think I'm expected to, the way I'm used to thinking, and and as I'm, I'm wondering if it's inductive versus deductive in some sense, and that I should be more in, uh, inductive. Um, but but like if it is living systems, if 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 there if it's if it's these threads reaching out to find each other, kind of there's a discovery process inherent in the motion, right? Mm -hmm. Th then how do we? How do we think like that? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of my question. I don't know. How, to how do we build systems that that actually make the emergence emerge rather than exactly, exactly? Yeah. And so it's not top down. It's got to be more agile. I think right. it's, it is more. I think there's inductive. You do there's more experimentalism to it. it. There's an evolutionary component. I mean, I think we can start to identify things that you know tend in this direction. Um, and this is where you know this is why I keep going back to that idea of the monocrop having a different kind of mycelial system because the systems bump up against each other and influence each other. And so it's not like you get to just design a system and have it be preserved. It, there's going to be another system and they're going to, anyway, so it's somehow this, this it's the interaction of the systems that's going to make the transformation. And as I'm reading through this, um, the I mentioned it last week, I guess, I think, but the uh, uh, seeing like a state book, and the example that I'm getting into now is like how we how we developed last names. Um, and, you know, in a village, you didn't need a last name. You knew mm -hmm. who people were. And if people didn't know exactly where you were. You would be the son of the banker and then they would know who you were, kind of, you know. And last names became more important as government gets larger and larger. And so that it's it's the government perspective of its people that require, you know, if you want to have a census, you know, and you want to keep a list of people, then you start to need last names. 
Um, <laughs> but the, so there's a state component, I think, and that's kind of the argument he's taking. But at the same time, the way he's describing it, his last name's developed also out of a tribalism, I think. Like you, if you were if you were prestigious, you wanted to affiliate with the other, or if you were almost prestigious, or if you had prestigious relatives or something like that, you wanted to affiliate with those. So you would you would you would claim your tribe, you know, with another name, and that was, but that was a systemic kind of response, right? It was coming from inside the system. Yeah, um, we were actually having a conversation about my my last names last week about that. <laughs> I have two last names, one that I was born with uh, and one that I've used all of my life pretty much for that reason. My dad thought he should assign me a prestigious last name rather than the one he had himself. And it uh, backfired because I've been using the other one all my life. So, <laughs> well, and then like when we were, you know, when I was teaching it, we were, you know, Peace Corps in Africa and all the kids have these funky names and then the names would change and, I just never understood what was going on. And I realized kind of how uh, unimaginative our naming system is, in, you know, in the US, that, you know, you kind of get one name and you're usually stuck with it. And, um, and you know, people play with it and then they get made fun of for playing with those naming systems and stuff like that. But like I was living in contexts where they had a, very, a vastly different uh, identity around naming, but I didn't understand it. I didn't see it, you know, so. Um, I, if you don't mind, I, I'd really like to to go touch on what you first said about um, the relationship between this and the other conversation on the OGM list, because I do think that these things are an effort to fulfill that emergent desire. And we don't know how to do it, so we end up fighting at the level of, of what's already been, why people are reacting the way they're reacting rather than realizing that they don't have a better way to arrive at an answer in their context. In their context, that's the answer they come up with. And if they had a system of arriving at better common understanding, um, then I think they would arrive at different understanding and we would understand them better and they'd understand them uh, us better. Um, and so I think it, it it doesn't solve the problem, but it gives us a place of not fighting each other. And so the intention here, I think both in Neo books and in, in uh, our protocols, is not to build something to fight about ideas, but to test ideas and recognize that testing ideas is actually what life does. And so how do we do that? There's a there's a really interesting question that, that's important to me in what you just said, which is that sometimes people show up for the fight on purpose because it's their strategy. And how do you transform the intended fight into a productive discussion about the issues the way you'd like to see it happen? But 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 uh, I call it a, a denial of discourse attack. Uh, for example, <laughs> is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a valid, if underhanded strategy to try to destroy discourse on things because it keeps people from talking about stuff. And when they don't get through difficult issues together, they trust each other less, they seize other other uh, theories, all kinds of bad stuff happens. So it's a, it's a legitimate, and these days, uh, all too popular strategy. And, and I'm very interested in the Aikido move <clears throat> that converts the inbound energy realistically of antagonism and fight, 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 or denial or whatever, and neutralizes that or better yet converts it to productive discourse. I, that's, that's a, just that process really fascinates me and I find really important. Well, I, I, go ahead. You know, I, I, we've talked about this point before and I just wanted to raise it in terms of your article in terms of, um, information is is typically seen more as content than process and the things that people have been talking about is something that's more living dynamic emergent um, and it's more focusing on process so you know to me the, the framing of even when you put living collaborative information information to me implies something more static than dynamic it does change over time i agree um but um you know, focusing on transformational learning 
and and transform and collaborative learning. It's an evolving process of truth seeking and ethical discernment. So, you know, coming back to your piece in terms of of you know how to develop hooks, so to speak, a series of hooks that you know compels people to 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 follow and go to the next paragraph, as uh, Jack's mentioned, I think would be, and you could even put it into AI and ask it, give me a series of hooks based upon these premises and see what ideas it comes up with. I mean, I was playing around with AI as you were doing that, actually, but I didn't come up with anything that I thought was uh, worth showing yet. Uh, Jack, so you were going to jump in? Oh, um, no, I, I was actually, but I just lost the thought. The, the thought is lost. It'll come back. No worries. I sometimes leave a note to myself in the chat to uh, to remind me of the thing I, I know I want to say so that then I can come back and pay attention. <clears throat> Stuart. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> two veins of thought. One is listening to some of the conversation about, you know, truth seeking um, and finding, quote, right answers versus emergence. Um, I started rewatching. I, I haven't. I've been having trouble sleeping at night. Slash, I go to sleep. I sleep for four hours. I wake up, um, and I started to rewatch Maestro, um, the wonderful Bradley Cooper film <clears throat> about Leonard Bernstein. At the beginning, there was this wonderful quote that was flashed, and I think I caught it. Um, and it's a Leonard Bernstein quote. A work of art does not answer questions. It provokes them and surfaces the tensions between the many contradictory answers. And so as I um, kind of conceptualize the, my understanding of the Neo Book Project, it was to create what I call living books or living content. In other words, it was to it was to get people bouncing ideas off of whatever was initially um, put out there. And so I just wanted to kind of remind us of that and to personalize that a little bit. You know, one of the things I realized reflecting when I was away, and you guys seem to have made some progress in terms of something concrete um, to which I had a, a, a reaction. One was, oh, this is great. There's something concrete. Two, uh, I don't want to go through any kind of vetting process personally, all right? Um, so I've got what, what has evolved into about a 200-page manuscript. And... It, it requires participation of other people um, because there's a lot of stuff that I raise and open up that I don't really have the answers to. And I'm looking for input of others. Um, and that's about all I wanna say right now. Mm -hmm. If I might ask a question. Um... How do you want to put your manuscript in the world? Do you want to only put it in as a completed book when you feel like it's done? Or do you want to parse it up into nuggets or something else and put it out in other ways? So um, I don't want to parse it into nuggets. Um, and I don't want to put it out as a completed manuscript because it's not intended to be a a completed manuscript. It's intended to be a manuscript, but it's 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 just a a place I think for um, to generate more thinking about what it is that I've said. Um, so, if it's neither of those paths, which is the path that you would like? Um, here's what I've got. Okay, and I'm 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 going through it one more time as an editorial piece. Here's what I've got. Um, please um, add to it, comment, 
um, expound. So I'm assuming basically with Google talk, Google doc comments and edits and suggestions, is that, is that your preferred mode? Yeah, I, I guess so. I, I, you know, not being a technologist, there are probably many different vehicles by which that could be done. As a matter of fact, I actually thought, hmm, um, and this is not like any kind of exclusive, I said, <clears throat> maybe I should just throw it up on my website and invite comments or, or you know, depending upon the technical um, capacity of the folks that, that do my, my, my website and technical stuff. Um, this is where the um, technical questions that Pete Kaminsky and I were bringing up in these calls early on that I think turned everybody off. But Pete and I were trying to figure out uh, Jack's for you as background because it way predates your, your joining us here. But uh, Pete and I were trying to figure out what does it mean to have feedback on any piece of information? And there could be lots of different layers or kinds of feedback. One of them is just the usual comments on a blog post. And those are common with different kinds of blogging software, or there's an article somewhere, and at the bottom is a is a series of often unrelated. It's not even a threaded discussion. It's just a, a string of comments, and it's up to the author of the piece to go back and read them all and maybe pick one up and, and add it to it. Another way is Google Docs kind of suggestions where you actually mark up some text and maybe even type in the alternative, which is pretty cool. And somebody just goes, yes, no, yes, no, or adapts and adopts the, the changes and so forth. But there's other ways that, of doing this. And one of the reasons that we're using uh, GitHub is that there is a known among programmers, it's a little bit geeky, but there's a known way of suggesting changes or even forking a piece of text. Because the first thing that happens in GitHub is I would make a copy, I would fork your repository uh, over into my account, and then I sort of make it better in way, ways that I can. <clears throat> and in GitHub, what you do is you suggest, uh, uh, you make a pull request, which is way much geek, well, tremendously more geekery than Google Docs. But Did you just say Greek geekery? Geekery. Geekery. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendously more geekery than Google so, Docs, but but it has other powers that that appeal to Pete and me, which is why we were sort of going there. Right. So to so to actually concretize this, okay. Um, so I posit thirty five areas of 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 um, of society, of the way we've constructed society that at this point in time need need attention, okay? If, if we are to evolve and survive as a species, right? Um, and I don't know how to do all those 35 things. So I'm looking for expertise in these areas where someone has some concrete and specific suggestions, okay? So it's not a comment as much as um, sh a sharing of expertise. So, um, Stuart, are you inviting collaboration around a question, perhaps? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or to, to, to say it differently, um, Perhaps if I wasn't as lazy as I am, I would do the research myself <laughs> and suggest ways to go in this area. But no, I think it would be much more fun to get people who are, you know, experts in this arena to comment on it. And yeah, I, I, I guess I could do some groundwork to invite others to comment on it, mm -hmm. who I know have expertise in particular areas. Mm -hmm. Do you see it, do you see this going on? So you're saying on, so if I might just ask a question, it, you see this going potentially onto your website as something that people can interact with, if it were like a Google Docs. So I just, I might've lost the thread there. Sure. And then, yeah, something like, is that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then... <laughs> Uh, anyone who comes across it or seeks it out, 
then is able to interact and then go, oh, well, here's a great suggestion for point number 13. Yeah. This, this, you, know, you know, they're doing that over in Atlanta. Or they're doing yeah. this over in New York, that sort of thing. So bringing it together. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Mm. Um, I, I, I've just kind of gotten to the point with it myself as a as an artist that oh it's time to get this out okay um, you know maybe because I was ill it's like you know I don't want to die with this you know on my on my hard drive it's it's time to put it out mm -hmm. and as you know as Seth Godin would say um, you know you got to deliver <laughs> that's how he's been so prolific because that word delivery is a is a big byword of his. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I have been reading, I'm just trying to think of who it is. I'll have a look in a moment, pop it in there if I find. Um, I have been reading, I don't think it was a sub stack, just a, a medi medium posts where there are authors who are doing that and putting up a chapter or putting, here. here's my stuff, I'm just... Yeah through the whole process here's the yeah. next chapter jump in let me know what you think but i think that's more like what jerry's talking about in terms yeah. of that blog yeah. style interaction yeah my, my buddy alan briskin is doing that and alan was a guest on society 2045 um with a book he's working on on fields they use sutra as the vehicle to get um comments from people and then uh revise the the chapters Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the best vehicle, but it it seemed to it seemed to work. Mm -hmm. well, sometimes with with this, it's you know um, it's testing it. Then you get the feedback, and you've you've got action, which will then start to provide clarity. Um, and then you'll see whether it's working or not, or whether you need to take a different action. Yes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's unfortunately not been enough progress on <clears throat> how this engagement and collaboration auto work could work works better uh state of the art is google docs right now uh sutra and there's a, a bunch of other sort of power tools for collaboration uh none of which has really broken through i mean there's a bunch of people writing uh, manuscripts in notion which has multi-user editing and a bunch of other good things too about it that's kind of cool uh, one, of the, one of the reasons I think for that, Jerry, which um, became clear to me a number of years ago uh, with all of the work group software that was out there, is that folks were, quote, um, nominally selling collaborative tools, but really what they were selling was connectivity tools, which is a very, very important distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anyone else with thoughts on this? To, to, I, I've mentioned this before, but just to play off the met, uh, the musical metaphors, uh, of course, I'd be curious to know uh, <clears throat> where you are with this, and still what you were talking about a moment ago, because as you were talking, you know, is it the maestro, the conductor, uh, so to speak, uh, or is it a is it a jazz improvisation session? Um, and along those continuums, I think it's a question of uh, how do you balance the dynamics between the two for the desired outcome? Because I think they both have they're both they can both have downsides and be problematic in different ways. So where's the sweet spot? So that's a that's a wonderful framework. I mean, what pops up immediately in my mind is the is the maestro piece, and you know that might be ego talking. But the idea of you know of pointing in a direction versus um, um, just something that's like totally spontaneous. Mm -hmm. I think that you that access of to both worlds, in other words, yeah, yeah, that access of orchestra conductor versus jazz quintet or whatever um, is really interesting, and jazz has. I, I, I'm not that much of a musician or know much about it, but uh, jazz has standards. There are a whole, there's a long repertory of songs known as jazz standards. 
and you you master jazz standards to become a well-known musician you know in in the field but then what's interesting is that the standards become like the nuggets the tropes that we all know about unemployment or about uh, inflation or about uh, drug addiction or about homelessness like it's weird there's there's sort of jazz standards for the liberal and 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 conservative positions on each of those things and in some interesting way what we're trying to provoke or create is a lively environment where people can riff on or improvise on but then agree on and find harmony in the jazz standard equivalents of our socio-political economic questions of the day um and and I, what i like about the jazz metaphor a lot is that a good jazz group is responding to each other but they've got a direction because they pick this standard to play and when they when they skip notes or play something that seems completely unrelated what makes it a great piece of jazz improvisation is that everybody knows that the thing they're not playing right now is in there because it's the negative space and the notes that they're actually playing around it or something like that that they're still they're still working around a framework together and listening to each other so that what the, the sounds they make are complementary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that there's way too many subgenres of jazz for me to even begin to understand what's going on. But um, but I love that. Jazz is the, is the very lively part of it, where it feels sometimes like orchestras. You have one person in charge whose taste is dominant for a particular work, and they're going to say, no, 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 I want that softer uh, let's draw that out, <clears throat> attack that more, whatever it might be, to each different component in the orchestra. And it's up to the people in the orchestra just to play the thing the way that person wants it as best you can. And that, that to me is a very different arrangement of creative minds around uh, a problem. And there's lots of things to love about classical music, but it's a very different arrangement. And the degree to which there's jazzy interactions in an orchestra, I am completely unaware. Yeah, Thanks. what pops um, Go ahead, Stuart. Thanks, Jose. What pops up uh, around that is um, <clears throat> the idea of, you know, are there really answers to some of the things that we're all grappling with? Um, is there really a right or wrong answer? Um, or is it, you know, that we're in a great place of experimentation, of trying this or trying that, you know, to use, you know, Jose's words, you know, the the idea of emergence, or as, as I like to think about that in some ways, third body, you know, it's not one or the other, but something different is created um, out of the um, coming together of two different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was going to say. Thank you, Stuart. Because I was going to say, I I don't think it's as much about coming to agreement, like negotiating an agreement. You know, it, it, it's more of um, that some idea, some concept stands the test of time. And after a while, maybe it no longer tests, stands the test of time, right? Something's changed. And now it's time for something else. And and it's okay because the next generation will add a new nuance to it and will make it better and, and make it different and so on and so forth. I think that this concept of agreement is, is uh, very symbolic, right? Like I know something and you know something and we can come up and agree. The reality is, I don't know shit. You know less shit. And, uh, you know, we're going to do the best we can do is come up with something that might serve us right now in the moment if we if it works. And if it does, it will stand the test of time. And if it if it does stand the test of time, then it would be better that someone else be able to start there than to spend a lot of time getting to that point. Right. And and I think that's it, it's hard to articulate, but it, it it feels to me like this is all just a an opportunity to step back 
from the ego of I know and you know. It, it's also, um, I think, reflective of that phrase that no doubt many of us have, of us have heard. Um, the longer I live, <laughs> the less I realize I know. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying wisdom is a measure of your depth of understanding your ignorance is that what you're saying there you go okay that sounds awfully wise another way another way of, another way of saying it rick <laughs> exactly that yeah well we're trying to create a wise space here we're trying yeah. to create a, a space where these things can emerge and where people who might have substantially different perspectives on something and strangely, the more different, the better, kind of, although it makes everything more complicated, uh, where they might find common ground or a shared resonance in the story without agreeing to every dot and tittle of, of you know, detail in, in everything. I think there's, there's, there's some, uh, Quakers have a, a thing called the sense of the meeting. When, they, when Quaker groups make decisions, they'll have a discussion and they'll, uh, you know, most of the people will have a chance to say something about it. And the clerk of the meeting, which is a rotating position, will at some point say, I, th I think I have a sense of the meeting and they'll report in what they've heard. And they'll be like, general agreement, like, good, we're good, on onward. And that's, they're just processing what they heard everybody say and they're synthesizing uh, the, the results of it. And I think that AI is going to play a big role in that for us. I think that AI is going to help us be that minute taker and say, based on what I've heard, this is what I'm seeing as that that middle ground that maybe uh, gives us a place of not having an ego to fight. Wait a minute, you're deciding what I'm saying. But if there's something that we are not as defensive about, that might help us move beyond if I can maybe just go off at a, a, a slight tangent, but related to what you're just saying in terms of the learning process. And I was in a, I, I lose track of where, what I said, where sort of things in these Zoom meetings, but somebody was talking about that, you know, that the lecturer are just lazy, emotional deciders. And I, I took umbrage to that because I felt, well, actually, I see them more as damaged learners. Uh, you know, you, saying that people are lazy and just emotional learners, they don't follow mm -hmm. logic, or rationality, whatever is. And so it comes back to a point that you're you're alluding to, which is, well, if you if we can actually, um, you know, use AI in such a way that we actually enhance people's inquiry skills, their curiosity skills, their imagination skills, their innovation skills from a young age so that the born inquirers trying to seek truth, knowing that there's a spectrum of truths from a dichotomous truth to a, a, a multiplicity of truths to contextual truths. I mean, that's uh, Perry's framework of cognitive development. And that, you know, there are places where you can be categorical about truths. This is true, this is false. There are other areas where there's uncertainty and there's a multiplicity and we don't know. And then, of course, contextual relativism is, well, some truths are more truthful than others, and we can discern them, but it's not the ultimate truth. So, you know, if, if we can imagine, this is the reason why I want to come back to transformational and collaborative learning. If AI can enable us to um, sort of unleash, as Adam Grant says, our hidden potential, and boy, do we have a lot of hidden potential that gets stymied by fear, rage, or whatever, and we have closed mindset. If we can cultivate a culture where people have that open-mindedness, a space for both the, the maestro and the improvisers, where there's a fluidity, a dynamic emerging, that means completely and utter transforming our, our learning systems rather than our educational systems. Um, anyway, I'm putting a link into this because I, um, uh, uh, David, I just want to let you know, Nikki and I decided to do one session. I just chatted with her before I came onto this call and I put it into the GRC Slack. And um, it's, it's about something that I've been working on for some time and I raised here about how to use songs creatively. And I know, uh, you know, there, there were some issues that people had about it, but 
um, I, I, I've developed a body of work and I'm just getting to the point where I feel, okay, I can, I can go live with this now. And I'll give you one example. Last night, I was on a Zoom call and it was for a group called Focus for Democracy. And Aaron Frank, who's the sort of spearhead leader of this, is a, is a maestro at fundraisings for directing funds towards organizations that will focus on the seven swing states where there's just a 1% margin or 300,000 votes, which will decide the electoral college over the popular vote. Anyway, I was, I was, and I was having, I wasn't in the inner, inner sanctum of this group of the Zoom call. I was, in a, uh, I was among the 3,600 people who were listening in. And I, I was able to have a few exchanges with him. And I said, would you mind if I write a song about the work that you're doing? And I woke up in the middle of the night, wrote a song, and then this morning I revamped it, uh, and I'll share that as well. And to me, it speaks to the issue of, well, how could we be far more creative in creating learning experiences that go beyond the typical, uh, you know, pedagogical methodologies and traditional academic symposiums where it's just content creation and transfer rather than focusing on process. I'll put those two links in there. So if people are interested, you can take a peek at them. Thanks, sir. Two, two quick thoughts. One, um, the word truth just brings up a lot of cautionary um, thoughts for me because in, in so many different situations, there are multiple um, truths. One, and two, I agree about um, AI, but um, the word discernment pops up. Um, it can be a very useful tool, but it has to be has to be coupled, I think, with with um, with discernment as a, and critical thinking um, as a as kind of a an overview, unless it's proven to be smarter than we are. <laughs> Or, well, that's not a high bar. Or, or when it's or when it's proven to be much smarter than we are. <laughs> well, so what, I would argue, what I would argue, Stuart, is, is that actually if you develop people's inquiry skills and you couple it with ethical discernment, critical thinking, medical, it's not just, it's, you know, media literacy is another sure. emerging field. Uh, yeah. uh, and so it's really how do you enhance people's sovereignties to be, um, sort of open-minded truth-seeking free thinkers and that's and, and so we can debunk a lot of the fellowship models that are clearly highly dysfunctional yeah. and couple couple that with rick i think the um the emotional intelligence oh, to be absolutely. able to to be able to effectively engage in in, yeah. in real dialogue with with with, with someone else mm -hmm. Um, I put in the chat earlier, um, I've forgotten who it was, maybe it was Stuart was saying that AI can maybe help us do this thing. And I mentioned this on a previous call, but I just want to bring it back up. I was part of a, an online focus group-ish thing using a, a platform called Thinkscape. And I just put an article about Thinkscape and about how this works below it uh, in the chat. And Thinkscape was really cool because Everybody in <clears throat> everybody in this exercise was anonymous. You couldn't tell who anybody was. You had a, an animal and a color. Each person was like the orange raccoon. <clears throat> um, but everybody could comment, and we were moved from room to room, time boxed very you know very closely. So we didn't have a lot of time to do stuff. But the AIs were summaries summarizing what happened in each small group quite well. But then also in the middle of each session, the AIs were saying, "Oh, group three over there just said this. How about that?" and dropping them into, they were cross-pollinating the ideas that came from each of the groups. The whole thing was really quite productive and wow. um, I The only thing I sort of didn't like was when I'm in a group of people who are pretty smart, I kind of want to make the contacts and talk to them afterward. And here we, we all left this thing not knowing who any of the other participants were, because other than the orange panda or whatever. Um, that that was my, sort of my only uh, flaw with with the whole thing, and that was just a you know my my picky thing about liking humans and wanting to, get, to meet them, but but the process worked really well, and I I hope that there's a lot more of it, and I will see who else is using it. Yeah, I, I like to learn more about that. That's sounds... I recommend the article I pasted in. Yeah. 
Hey, hey Rick, is is that um, August twenty seventh, one to two p.m. Is that Pacific? Is it Eastern? What? Oh, it's what? Eastern. Sorry, sorry, I didn't put it in. Okay, it's oh. East. Yeah, yeah. No. actually, uh, I was going to, uh, you know, that that's something. Actually, Jerry, I'm not uh, working on Thursday in September, and if if the first Thursday or second Thursday of that. That's something I could um, learn from the experience of hosting that event and seeing whether they might be interested in using that for discussion, given the fact uh, we are going to be heating up for the election. So, um, Hosting which event? What do you mean? Oh, no, I'm talking about Thursday. Your Thursday uh, meetings that you have, uh, you know, that you, you said you had some openings in, in September. Um, well, we, we alternate between check-in format and topic formats. Okay. And so there's, there's openings for topics uh, always, like okay. ongoing, because I'm, I'm always taking suggestions from people about what we should uh, discuss as a group. Okay. Well, one of the topics could be the thing that I'm, I'm providing on the uh, August 27th. If there, is, there are other things. We can have a, a conversation offline about what might be most of interest to open global mindset people. Cool. Sounds great. Um, we're near the end of this call. Any concluding thoughts on the stuff we've covered? Well, what's the process for which, um, so I, I write, uh, I'll polish it up, uh, run it by some folks, um, and then I'll, I'll publish it. Yep. I'll send it to Pete. How do we then do the pop piece? Because um, yeah, do we send it to the OGM list and the NeoBooks list um, and ask everybody to, uh, to to pop it or what? what's the process here? I think yes, yes, yes. Uh, I think you need to figure out when it's done and then submit it to Pete for the Plex. Uh, and then you pick a time when you'd like it to pop. Maybe it's concurrent with its publication in the Plex on Wednesday. That would not be a bad time, or it could be some random time you like because you're going to have, you know, you're going to have a couple hours to follow up. Then put word out uh, on the Mattermost channel for NeoBooks, which is uh, uh, this little group, but also I would say on the OGM uh, list. And then we can chime in and say, this is what we're doing uh, and give everybody the link that you'd like them to, to, to boost on that day. Uh, and then I think that means, I think what I'm saying is that means that the post has to be available already to pop whenever you're sort of going to call the pop, which mean which might mean it publishes a couple of days earlier. It's just that we all decide to, to put our effort and retweet and comment on it at the same time. And I think my should... understanding is that generally the way LinkedIn works is it wants you to kind of jump on it right away. Yeah. Anything uh, that gets if, it, if it's going to get, good. yeah. Yeah. Otherwise you end up with uh, stale content and it doesn't populate it or, so... or distribute it. So that that would then say that you should post it to LinkedIn about the same time as Pete is publishing the Plex, if that's when you want to do it, and then put out the word, and we will all go do what we can. You know, one thing that uh, I, I've been involved in, of, of some of these being before, the, what I would suggest is, is to couple, couple it with a live meeting where people are present, because trying to get people to respond to something that you know it's got to be responded within a two-hour period is actually... You know people's lives are such so i don't know whether uh, the wednesday is a live meeting or not uh thursday clearly is but if you release it at a live meeting and then it, it, you know uh ask people to respond during the call um or even have it partially featured on one of the meetings so that you know people you discuss it so that yeah it might be a good idea if if that's okay with you jerry to, to mention it at ogm um on, that would be good yeah and and then if we do it on Wednesday and then follow up on OGM and and actually bring that uh, well, bring, bring that to I'm, light. Yeah, what I'm suggesting, the actual publishing happens at the meeting, so it's all set set up. And if there's somewhere else where people can read it in advance, and then you pop it, uh, then you're you're going to be within that two hour window. If indeed it makes a big difference. Good point. Let's cool. think about that. It it is quite early on, on Thursday, uh, for the the rest of the world. Um, so maybe we can maybe we can uh, go back and forth on that, Jerry. 
Sounds great. I think that the point is, is that if you just simply get you know, like five people writing comments with likes and things that within the two hours, then, I mean, people can respond to any time. It's just to see, I'd love to test it to see whether it really makes a difference. That's what this is about, right? Yeah. Yep. That's why we're doing this. Perfect. Cool. That Thank sounds you. Great. Good. And you will be our, you'll be the, uh, the guinea pig. The Neil Armstrong. You're trying to say something nice. The Neil Armstrong. No, no, no. The, the, the Neil Armstrong of, of Neo Books Pops. Take that first step. Then you can say the eagle has landed. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you everybody for the for the feedback and the conversation. I think that was that was helpful. So I'll I'll try to spend some time on it today and um, and and then fly it up the flagpole uh, so that we can publish it Wednesday. Sounds great. Perfect. With, with awesome. a view of increasing the signal and reducing the noise, right? Exactly. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank it's you. Everybody. Wonderful. Don't light up your garage with fireworks. I don't know how that happened. I don't know why. It happened because you did <laughs> this. Oh. I think you need it. Yeah, there you go. Sometimes, sometimes, it sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't for me. If you don't know, know the other signal, this is the oh. laser light, the laser light show. You have to be on a Mac. Yeah. Okay. And a certain version. Better. Yeah. You have to be on a Mac with the latest rev of the OS and this comes automatically. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye bye. Well, thank you.